and it is my great pleasure today to introduce to you our speaker, who has been called the gerrymander slayer of Pennsylvania. <laughs> so our speaker today is Dr. Carol Kunahold, am I saying it? Uh, who comes to us with a, a really um, varied background. She has a PhD in English Literature from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she has worked as a youth pastor with at-risk kids in Billy's Kensington neighborhoods. And she and her husband um, have three grown children. Um, Carol is going to talk to us about Fair District PA, which is the group that she heads up which um, is a nonpartisan, citizen-led, statewide coalition working to create a process for redistricting that is transparent, impartial, and fair. So without further ado, I give you Carol Kunal. Thank you for coming out today, and thank you for caring about democracy. Uh, we were talking at lunch about there's so much happening right now, there's so many ways to get involved, there's so many things to be concerned about, and I would say that, that many of them come back to the question of is our democracy working well or is it not? Are you being heard or are you not? And this is kind of at the heart of that. Do we have a functional representative democracy that hears its citizens and acts on things that they care about? And so we're gonna, we're gonna kind of dig into that. As Americans, we have some common assumptions that as the league, we, we say repeatedly, we say your vote is your voice, we say every vote counts. I've helped organize our video contest for teenagers and, and the first year we did it, the theme was your vote is your voice. And at the same time, I feel a little dishonest because I know in many of our counties, in many of our districts, in many of our voting places, our vote is not our voice. Um, my vote doesn't count at all in my legislative races. Those have been assigned long before the primary takes place. So we want to understand why that is and what we can do to change that. So little, this is a really wonky topic, and I apologize. A Friday lunch, that was a delicious lunch. Thank you so much for that wonderful lunch. That was terrific. Um, so you have a wonderful lunch, and the tendency is to not want to think really hard. And there's no way we can talk about this topic without doing some thinking. It's a, it's a thoughtful topic. And whatever your interest is, it gives you places that you can dig in. So we've got volunteers who go crazy over maps volunteers who are really deep into history, data, policy, law. You can go in any direction. I'm going to try to skim across the surface of all of that, but even to get there, it's a little bit wonky. And we're going to start with vocabulary. Sorry, but we have to do that. So the first word is reapportionment. So by law, every 10 years, there's a census. And the census counts everybody. There are 435 legislative seats in the House of Representatives, so 435 seats, and those have to be divided across the states as evenly as possible. So when population moves, those seats have to be reapportioned. They get redivided among the states. Now historically, Pennsylvania loses population relative to other parts of the states that are gaining population. So if you look at my nice graphic here, we are one of, the, one of the states that continues to lose. We've lost the last couple decades. We will lose at least one more seat in the next reapportionment. So, remember that word. People say, why do they do gerrymandering? It's like, well, it's just, it's just a couple of words you need to know before we get there. So reapportionment is one. Then after that comes redistricting. So if we go from, last time we went from 19 to 18 seats, Next time we'll go from 18 to 17 seats. So the map needs to be redrawn to keep those districts even. At the same time, this, people within the state are moving around. And in Pennsylvania, they tend to be moving from kind of rural areas to more suburban areas. They're moving from cities to suburban areas. We've got younger people now moving back into cities, but population is shifting. So when that happens, then we also need to redraw the district maps for the state senate and the state house. So all of that redistricting, redistricting happens at the same time. Each state has a different process for the congressional or for the state legislative. So as I said, it's a wonky topic. In Pennsylvania, the congressional districts are done as a simple piece of legislation. It's introduced to the House and the Senate. 
They pass it, it goes to the governor, he signs it. So it's a simple bill. For the state House and Senate race uh, districts, that's done by a five-person commission. So each party leader in each house chooses somebody else, another party leader, and then those four people are supposed to choose the fifth person. They never agree, or they rarely agree. It's a long time since they agree. And so that fifth person will then be selected by the state Supreme Court. So that gives you a five-person group. And there's some rules about how this happens. In particular, um, in Pennsylvania, the, the um, Senate and House districts are supposed to be compact and contiguous. And they are supposed to not divide more than necessary any county, city, town, borough, township, or ward. <coughs> we'll see how that plays out. And this brings us to our third word, which is gerrymandering. So you've got reapportionment, you've got redistricting, and then gerrymandering is the manipulation of electoral maps for political advantage. The way that it's set up in Pennsylvania is legislators are the ones who control the maps. So they have a great incentive to make those maps work well for them. So that's gerrymandering, manipulating those maps for their advantage. The first time that term was used was in 1812. Governor Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts approved a map that looked like a salamander, according to the newspapers of the time. So somebody came up with the portmanteau, the word of two, combining two words, into the word gerrymander, and that term has been with us ever since. And there's Albert Gerry. He became, um, he was actually one of the signers of the Constitution. He became a vice president. Um, so he did other things, but this is what he's remembered for. <laughs> So this is a graphic that explains gerrymandering a bit. Um, if you look at the population, if you had 60% blue, 40% red, you could draw the lines that would give you perfect representation. So the second graph there, see the black lines? Those are your district lines. You're dividing it into five districts. You could divide it up so your representation is exactly even to the population. So you get three blue districts, two red districts. Now, is that the ideal way to do it? Maybe not, because what you end up is districts that are safe, there's no competition, and those kind of skew to the more extreme because the only election in those districts is at the primary, which tends to be the party faithful. But that would be fair, right? In a certain way. Um, is that ideal? Maybe not. The next one is gerrymandered by blue. So blue gets to draw the lines. They can draw in such a way that they just draw red completely out of the game. See that? Red has no voice at all. Blue, blue got five districts. They have five representatives. Red gets nothing. Now if red, through some happenstance, got to draw the lines, they could do something more creative. And this is where you start seeing the strange lines. So, so notice that, that third one. There's nothing strange looking about those lines. It's not that they're contorted or weird. It's just somebody drew it in such a way that they win. Um, so you can't necessarily tell by looking at lines what's going on. It, there's something behind the lines you need to understand. But in this last one here, red gets to draw the lines. They do a little bit creatively, and they can make themselves have the majority, even though they don't have the majority. Okay? So, to me, that puts us in the position of we are all red or, green, red or blue integers, and in truth, we're people. And we all have different points of view, we all have different values, things that are important to us. Some of us are very red, very conservative. Some are kind of maybe fiscal conservatives, but not social. You know, we, we have our, our dividing lines on that, and the same with blue. Some of us are independent. Some of us are Green Party. There's a Prohibition Party in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you knew that. They endorse us. I'm very proud of that. Um, so the different, different parties. Now, if you had a population like that population on the left, and you drew the lines as I've drawn them on the left, who would those candidates appeal to? On the left. Everybody, thank you. They'd have to appeal to everybody. They'd have to come forward in such a way that they make clear, I hear you, I know what matters to you, and I have solutions that will work for a majority of you. They couldn't go off to either red or blue extreme and think that they were gonna win. They couldn't. They'd have to appeal to the whole, the whole group, and especially to the center. Now you could, you, could, you could solve that problem. If you're a politician and you don't want to have to work that hard, you can make it easy for yourself through what's called 
a sweetheart gerrymander or a gentleman's agreement or a partisan handshake. It's always gentlemen. I don't know of any state where women have been involved in this game, just the way it is. But um, you could draw in such a way that you don't really need to compete for those votes, so you create safe districts for yourself and for the other party. Now, I have a state senator. The first time I met with him to talk about gerrymandering, he said, this is not a problem. My colleague and I, we sit down and we divide the neighborhoods between us. Uh, <laughs> and he didn't know why. There were four of us League of Women Voters folks staring at him with our mouths open. He still doesn't get it that that is a little offensive to us as voters. Now, in Pencil let me just say, in Pennsylvania, um, our, our redistricting folks have managed to get rid of that middle, that middle one. I mean, sometimes if you do gerrymandering, you end up with some swing districts. Swing districts are hard work for legislators because they've got to really appeal to the people. And they've done a great job across the state and across the country of getting rid of as many of those as they can. Now, in, there's some other forms. I'm not going to go through all the different forms of gerrymandering there are, but one is called cracking. And that's when you take a population, you split it out so that that population has less voice. And if you look at Pennsylvania's small cities and large townships across the state, you'll see cracking going on in an amazing way. I'm, I'm giving you one of, I, I, I keep changing what I think is the best example, but this one just makes me really mad. This is the west side of the state. This is house districts. In the middle there is Beaver Falls. I don't know if you know anything about Beaver and Beaver Falls. It's a quite poor uh, post-industrial um, area. And by rights, Beaver, Beaver Falls should have a representative that represents that community. Look what was done. There's four house districts and very creatively drawn. So the Beaver, Beaver Falls area is a tiny percentage of the, all those districts. And there's nobody at all in Harrisburg thinking about that. Now go across the state, anytime you see that kind of weirdness going on, zero in and you'll see. Ah yes, there's Allentown, there's Scranton, there's Wilkes-Barre, there's Go across to Johnstown, who knew? You know, I, I saw this weird, I saw this, you know, all of these big areas, you know, very nicely configured, and then this one, like, very strange little thing going on. Zoom in, it's Johnstown. It's a city that's been in distress a very long time. Does it have anybody in Harrisburg staying up awake at night trying to figure out how to solve Johnstown? Not a soul, because it's divided out into four districts. So that's cracking. Now, another form is packing, and packing is, what you'll see around our larger cities, around Philly and Pittsburgh, where you take the lines and you loop in the party that belongs with the city and you kind of free up the districts around it. And District 1 here in Philly has been doing some packing over the years and it just keeps creeping out further and further to loop in a particular population. Now the packing going on here is particularly of interest because part of it is, is maintaining a safe district for the congressman who has that district. But there's some racial stuff going on in that packing as well. So if you were to do the demographics of those weird bloopy things that are coming up out of that, you think, why is it drawn that way? Well, part of it is to keep the party packed in. Part of it is to maintain a safe white district in what would otherwise be a minority district. Um, so that person has been in office a very long time. And if those districts were drawn fairly, uh, that would probably change. The last time around, leadership on both sides said, vote for this map. Most of the legislators didn't even see the map. They didn't know what the map contained. But the leadership on both sides said, vote for this map, because it was protecting certain people they wanted to protect. So the key question to me is not so much which party gets the most seats. That's an important question, and that gets played out. But to me, the far more important questions are, whose vote counts the most? or whose vote doesn't count. And in, in reality, when the, seat, when the districts are drawn the way they are, most of our votes don't count. And whose voices are discounted? In reality, the way the lines are drawn right now, most of our voices are discounted. What we say really doesn't matter much. And what values are rewarded? <clears throat> not problem solving, not good policy. What's rewarded right now is obedience to the party leaders. So. Pennsylvania has um, many bad districts, but this one, District 7, ends up on any list of the worst five gerrymandered districts in the country. This will be one of them, District 7. Do any of you live in District 7? There you are. Uh, I live in District 6, and District 7 just kind of keeps dancing around me, and I actually have to go through 
District 7 pretty much to get anywhere, but I don't live in District 7. Um, it's been described as Goofy kicking Donald. It's also been described as Goofy kicking Mickey Mouse. Um, it's been described as Bullwinkle, um, the antlers. Uh, see that? It's pretty cool. And um, somebody else describes it as spin art. You know those things where you put uh, paint on a thing and it spins? Um, that's another way to describe it. No, it's the, people get interested in the shapes. The shapes are not really the point. It's what's being done with those shapes. It's what's behind the shapes. And I call this three, three district um, configuration the trifecta. Because to me, it's, a, it's how do you guarantee win across three districts in a way that disenfranchises everybody in those three districts? Genius. This is it. Um, so there's District 7, District 6, D District 16. There's a ton of stories going on. I was, I was, sometimes I have to laugh. I was on the radio last week with the head of the, um, the GOP, GOP chair in Philadelphia who was explaining why District 7 was drawn that way. And he said, well, we want to make sure Pat Meehan's district, he still lived in his district, so we had to finagle the lines a little bit. <laughs> Had to finagle the lines a little bit. I have kind of speechless even thinking about it. Um, but what's really happening there? So there's a number of things happening there. So look at District 16. Um, District 16 to me is a, a crime. Um, it's a crime. So it starts, you could say it starts in Coatesville, over here, which is a poor, very poor, uh, struggling minority population runs down through Chester County horse country, very wealthy, goes up through much of Lancaster, Lancaster farmland, and ends up in Reading, up in the top there. So who, who does that representative, who does that congressman think about? Who does he appeal to? Who does he look toward when he runs? Well, certainly not Reading. And what we know about Reading is it is the poorest, the, the, in the last census, and I believe the census before, it had the highest share of citizens living in poverty in the nation. Has the most underfunded school district in the country. Has had for a long time. Now who, who is thinking about Reading and solving the problems of Reading? If you were that congressman, Reading is an afterthought, if at all. So that's a piece of what's going on here, but there's some more pieces going on here. Look at Montgomery County. What do you know about Montgomery County? It's purple. If you were to talk about color, it's red and blue, and mixed in every street has Republicans and Democrats living next to each other, lots of independents, Green Party folks. It's a very, very swing county. By number, it should have one, one congressional representative and part of another. Instead, it's drawn into five districts split into five districts. So go back to that constitutional requirement of not dividing anything more than it's necessary. Montgomery is split into five congressional districts and none of its congressmen live in Montgomery County. Genius. And so whose voice is, is lost? Well, certainly everybody in Montgomery County pretty much loses any ability to be represented through this particular game. And, and District 7 goes through, seven, through, through five counties. So from a League of Women Voters standpoint, trying to arrange debates or something like that is a huge headache. How do you do it? And many voters just say, you know, I give up. I don't know who my congressman is. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know where the lines are. I was talking to somebody. I was, I, as I said, sometimes I have to laugh. I was speaking at the Lancaster Rotary on Wednesday, sitting next to the head of the Lancaster Rotary, and he said, yeah, I'm in District 6. I said, wait, I'm in District 6. And we start talking about District 6, and he said he has called his congressman and been told, you are not in our district. And he's had that happen repeatedly. He's been told he's not in the district. He's at the very far, far end of the district. Um, our legislators don't know who's in their district, and we don't know whose districts we're in. It's really toxic to the way that democracy works. Now, how about things for you here in Delaware County? By number, you should be all in one district that should spill over. And really, if you look at the numbers, Montgomery County and Delaware County probably should share. I mean, Montgomery County should have one congressman, and then part of the county should be the other congressperson who would be shared with you. By numbers, that would come out pretty close. 
Um, instead, you are split into two, which, as I said, District 7 goes into five counties, and then District 1 kind of has worn, you know, weaseled its way out of Philly. Does that make you feel well represented? No. So you could do this. We, are, we have just started a campaign we're calling Know Your Maps. We have a page on our website, fairdistrictspa.com is the website. If you picked up the brochure, it's got our website on there. Um, and there's a place where you can look at district maps. And we've got some great volunteers who built these maps that you can zoom in and really look closely. So you could zoom in on your house map. It's very colorful. These are off of that, that website. Um, but you can zoom in and you can start looking. And the more you look, I promise, the more angry you'll be. I've spoken now in 16 counties across the state. Every time I go, I zoom in and look at maps and I think, what in the world? So people, the other thing that a person on the radio with me last week was saying, it's just, you know, Philadelphia gets three Democratic districts, Pittsburgh gets two, the rest of the state is Republican. Look at the maps and you'll see that is really not accurate, but it's been drawn as if we can just draw those people off the face of the earth and they have no voice whatsoever. Now it's not just about denying representation, it's also very much about keeping legislators in line. And the longer I've been doing this, the more conversations I have had with legislators about how this works. They're told how to vote and they're expected to vote the way they're told. And when they don't, they're punished. And one of the top forms of punishment is to X them off the map, which means simply to draw their district into oblivion. So there was a, a representative who lived in Ross Township, the other side of the state, District 29. You see it there in the middle of the yellow circle? District 29. He represented Ross Township and the township next to it. And he believed that your job as a representative is to vote for what benefits your constituency. Brilliant idea. His leadership, his leadership said, you, you need to stop doing that. They said, we will tell you what to vote for and you will vote the way we tell you. And he, he just ignored them. Um, he ignored them and they said, we will X you off the map. And he ignored them. So, there's Ross Township. Let me go back. There's District 29. District 29 was moved to the other side of the state. Vanished completely. And Ross Township was divided into four different districts. Now, who was punished? Legislator, for sure. He, had, he didn't have a district and he was out. He was out. Uh, there was a great warning sent to his colleagues, do what you're told, but Ross Township completely lost representation. So the people <coughs> of Ross Township were also punished. So this has been, gerrymandering has been going on for a long time. As I said, Elbridge Jerry was back in, in 1812. Uh, that's what, two, I'm not, my math is not great, over two, two centuries ago. But this has changed over time. So look at, look at District 7, and you can see it starts to do little weird things. But in the last decade, it yeah. went wild. And if you look across the state, across the country, you'll see the same sort of thing happening. Gerrymandering on steroids, gerrymandering gone wild. And what happened? Well, mapping technology. Think about the mapping technology available to you on your phone. We can do amazing things with maps that a decade ago, only, the, you know, only a handful of people had, and 20 years ago, nobody had even thought of yet. We can do great things with maps, but also data mining technology. How you vote, what you're reg registered as, your household income, what TV news broadcast you watch, all of that is available online. Easy to find. All that data is available. So when the map makers sit down to draw the maps, they can predict with great precision how block by block people will vote. And then they can divide the lines up with surgical precision to control the outcomes of the elections across the next decade. Genius. Now there's another piece to this, which is money. Um, so in 2010, Carl Rove wrote for the Wall Street Journal, he who controls redistricting can control Congress. Now again, this sounds politically incorrect because he said he, but the truth is there are no women that I know of anywhere who have ever been part of the backroom deals where this takes place. The leadership is men, and he who controls redistricting can control Congress. If you read this article, it starts in Pennsylvania. There we are. Republicans controlled 11 congressional seats and Democrats 10 before reapportionment. You know what that word means, right? Before reapportionment cost the Keystone State two seats in 2001. Afterward, the Republican legislature redrew the map to the GOP's advantage, 
creating 12 Republican seats and seven Democratic ones. So this was in the Wall Street Journal. I found this online. When I found it, I said, this is legal? And they're bragging about this? And so this was a, a strategy that was put out there to the public that whoever can capture state legislatures can then control the redistricting process and that in that way can capture complete control of Congress. That's the point, to control redistricting, to capture Congress. So in 2010, Red Map, Red Map 2010 campaign was launched. Well, it was launched several years before that, but um, the redistricting majority project, so Red comes from redistricting, Map majority project, it's genius. Red Map 2010, and the idea was to, to get money to target a handful of states where this could be done to great effect in order to control the legislative process in those states in order to get more congressional seats to capture a majority and hold it in Congress. So Pennsylvania was one of the top targets. We were the best bang for the buck, according to the guy who oversaw this project. And the result was Pennsylvania ended up with 13 Republican districts and five Democrat districts. Okay, and this is in a state that's pretty, this has a slight majority Democratic uh, registered voters, a little bit more Democrat than Republican, um, but the Republicans were able to get 13 <coughs> to five. Now, 2020 is coming toward us, and they've already announced the Red Map 2020, and they've set a target which is four times higher than the last target, and it's quite clear Pennsylvania, again, will be a top target. Um, there's a book called Rat, Rat F, asterisk, asterisk, C-K-E-D, by David Daly, which um, talks about the whole Red Map 2010 process and the really toxic mailers and the outside money that came in to flip specific districts. So they basically figured out which districts they were going to go after and they threw a ton of money into those districts with really slick mailers that were really pretty un unconscionably dishonest. Um, but they were effective. And they came out so close to the election that the average citizen said, oh my goodness, I didn't know. And the legislator who was targeted, it was so late that they had no way to, to come back and to combat that. So David Daly's book describes that. The first chapter in David Daly's book that focuses on states, Pennsylvania. And it's actually the only state in the book that has two chapters about it. So 2020 is coming at us. This, this, will be, this will be a big factor in 2020 if it doesn't get fixed. And it won't just be the Republicans the next time. So um, Advantage 2020 was announced uh, in 2015. Notice that graphic there. That's our District 7. Yes. Um, last year, Unrig the Map was announced. That's an effort to go after governor's races because if the governor has a role in signing off on legislation, you want to make sure the governor is on board. Notice this top four states targeted. Pennsylvania's one. And then we have the um, National Democratic Redistricting Committee with Eric Holder and Barack Obama. I've been told Pennsylvania is their top target. And Organizing for Action, which was the Organizing for America, which was Barack Obama's incredibly successful grassroots effort. They are very actively uh, at work here in Pennsylvania, uh, working with the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. This, this is going to be an interesting few years for democracy. And if we still have a democracy after this, um, it will be through the work of people like us. Because if we, if we don't pay attention and if we're not actively engaged, there's not much going to be left by the time this, this game gets played out. Now, why are we such a top target? Um, one, because we are one of the states that always needs to be redrawn because of redistricting. Um, we're one of the states that loses a seat or gains a seat, so our, our, our districts need to be redrawn. Um, another one is we're one of the few remaining large swing states. Uh, the only other ones are Florida and Illinois. Um, so we have a lot to gain. If it's a small swing state, there's not a lot you can do. You might you might eke out one seat, but look at the way they got 13 out of 18. That, that's a lot of extra seats when you think about it. Um, so we're a great target, and also we have really, really, really bad campaign finance laws. So outside money can come pouring into Pennsylvania, 
at a very fast rate, and there's very little reporting that gets done. There's very little way to know where the money comes from. There are very few um, safeguards against that. So no matter how you count it, Pennsylvania is very gerrymandered. Um, when we started this project, uh, we didn't have any way of measuring. We just knew it was a problem. But over the last year, all of these new ways of measuring it have kind of come to the fore. And by the new ways of measuring it, we're bad. So um, according to two that are getting a lot of interest, the efficiency gap and seats to vote, we are the worst in the country. And, and by a pretty substantial margin. Um, by the next one, we're the second worst, another fifth worst, another third worst. The Brennan Center for Justice did a, um, a kind of a large scale, scale study of states and gerrymandering, and they said there are three states where this is a deeply entrenched reality, and it's and, and consistently the worst among the states, and Pennsylvania is one of those three. So this has implications, and, and I could go, I, I, I I could go on for a very long time, and depending on my audience, I pull up different slides. We could talk about this, you know, the economic implications of this. We could talk about the social policy implications of this. We could talk about, you know, the impact on democracy. We could talk about the undermining of engagement by younger people as they realize that their votes don't. I mean, there are many, many ways that the implications go on, but I'm just going to call out just a couple of them because. I always run out of time, and I don't want to do that. So we have very little choice when it comes to legislative elections here in Pennsylvania. In the last legislative elections, 86% of our incumbents had no opposition in the primary. It's their seat. It's talked about as their seat. People say, oh, that's so-and-so's seat. Why would anybody bother to try to run against them? 86.6% had no opposition in the primary. And in the general election, it was going to be 57%. That's more than half with no opposition in the general election, in a couple of those places, there were write-ins. People just said, this is crazy. This guy is, a, <laughs> this guy is a disaster. Nobody even likes him, and I'm going to run against him. Um, so that pulled the number down to 48.7%. So it's not quite half where there was no opposition. But the reality is, many of the places where there was another name on the ballot was not a serious candidate. It was not somebody who was funded by the other party. In my own districts, my districts are assigned Republican, and they have been that way a long time. And there are no candidates who run, or if they do, they don't put up a website, they don't put up yard signs, they don't go door to door, they don't do anything. They get enough names to get on the ballot, and that's as far as they go. And across the state, I promise you, in many of our places where it looks like there's somebody running, there's really nobody running. There were only three seats that changed hands in the last election. Out of so think about this. We have 203 House seats and half of our Senate seats. So what's that, 228 seats, three changed hands? And I know those three people, and they all had taken a lead in reform. So their parties stepped back. <laughs> the other party leaned in. One of them actually had some gerrymandering that went on with his district, the one in the Senate and the three of them were gone. There's a strong message there. Don't play around with it, do what you're told. Um, there's a study that came out not long ago called Why Competition in the Politics Industry is Failing America by Catherine Gale and Michael Porter. Um, we did an event at the Pyramid Club with Catherine Gale not long ago. Um, and she talked about the way, um, they, they, they looked at the, econ the US economy and the way that the US political system is undercutting economic health. They've um, interviewed Harvard business grads to say, what do you see as the, the biggest impediment to a thriving U.S. economy? And the response has been our legislative system. For a number of years now, that's been the response, is that our legislative system is harming our economy. And they talk about, what are the outcomes for a healthy political system? It's that they come up with good solutions to the problems that we face. You know, reasonable regulation, good infrastructure, great training, ways of you know coming up with solutions to things like health care or immigration, um, practical, effective solutions, evidence-based solutions that uh, that would get broad citizen buy-in, and that respect the rights of everybody. That would be those would be outcomes for a healthy political system. Their conclusion is that our system is delivering none of those things, and they're right. Um, and so then they go on to say many citizens have come to believe that dysfunction is normal and inevitable. 
But that is not the case. It should not be normal and inevitable. And there are nations that do these things without any trouble at all. They come up with good solutions, that respect their constitutions, that have broad citizen buy-in. And we actually have some states that manage to do that, interestingly enough. But there are many of places that the dysfunction is so deep, people have come to believe that that's inevitable. And Pennsylvania is one of those places. It, I, you talk to people and they say, well, we've just learned how to kind of work around Harrisburg. That's not the way we should be relating to our legislative leaders. They also conclude that the system will not be self-correcting. There are not safeguards built into the system that will fix it. So what will fix it? Keep that question in mind. Um, one of the pieces of evidence that they offer is the declining number of moderates in the House and in the Senate. They've almost vanished. And the same is true in Pennsylvania. Moderates are disappearing. If, the only, if, if seats are assigned and the only way to keep your seat is by pleasing your party leadership, you can't even look like you're going to co cooperate with the enemy. You've got to blame the other for everything. And that's what we see. So this recent budget craziness that went on in Harrisburg is a, is a big example of that. The inability to sit down and come up with solutions that would put us on a better financial footing. It just doesn't happen. And so as a result, there's declining bipartisan support for important legislation. So if you look at some of the important legislation in decades past, there was huge buy-in from both parties. Highway Act was 50-50. Civil Rights Act, pretty much 50-50. Um, it, it, get, it begins to skew with the Medicare Act and Welfare Reform Act, and by the time we get to affordable care, there is no collaboration at all. There's no bipartisan buy-in. So what that means is, is policy just becomes a football. One party says, okay, well forget you, we're going to pass this, and the other party spends the next eight years or ten years or twelve years trying to repeal it or, or crash it or make it fail. That's disaster for everybody. Think about if you're the healthcare industry. How do you plan? You can't. And, and any employer, how do you hire if you don't know what health care is going to look like? It, it just undermines the economy, makes it incredibly difficult to plan, and hurts us all in many ways. So different states, as I mentioned, manage this in different ways. Some states are doing really well. Um, they've managed to sort out their democracy in a way that keeps citizens engaged and comes to good solutions. And some states are deep into an entrenched party system that uh, there's almost no possibility of reform, and Pennsylvania is one of those states. We are among the five worst by any electoral integrity uh, indicator. There's a study, I, I keep mentioning studies that come out, I, I just am constantly reading and trying to make the connections for people between what's going on with our districts, what's going on with our legislature, what's going on with other parts of our culture, our society that are of importance to people. Because so many of us get focused on one issue and we think, I just want to fix this, I don't have time to think about that. And what we're trying to say to people is, you are never going to fix that until you fix this. So whatever that is, you've got to fix this first. So one of the studies that I saw just recently is this Communities in Crisis. The uh, um, Pennsylvania Economy League has been looking at the economies of our cities, boroughs, municipalities, wards. And what they see is a growing, a deepening fiscal distress. They say over the last quarter century, our economy has been going down here in Pennsylvania. I, I was actually at a, lunch, at a breakfast on Wednesday listening to the people who put this report together. They talked about the fact that our, our geographic location is really our only, uh, the only thing that's kept us from complete financial disaster because the top real estate market in the world right now is Northeast USA. Mm -hmm. So we're right in the middle of the top real estate market in the world, so that's kept us from complete disaster, but even so, by every financial indicator, Pennsylvania keeps going down. And 10 years ago, part of the reason, they say, is because the codes, the zoning, the tax regulations, all of that, that governs the way we do business in Pennsylvania is at least half a century old. And they, they've gone to the legislature repeatedly to say, you need to look at regional planning, you need to look at the way these things work, and they've had no buy-in at all. Which, remember the cracking out? All of, those, all of those entities that should be represented are cracked out so that their le legislators are not paying attention and not listening. So they, they say the, all of these entities are creatures of the state, until the state legislature takes a role, fiscal distress will only get worse. 
And there's nobody in Harrisburg right now remotely interested in addressing this. So we started Fair District's PA in January of 2016. Laura Lavin was one of our founding members. She was there. Um, it was Common Cause Pennsylvania, League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Council of Churches, Committee of 70, and a number of other organizations came together to say, we've been talking about redistricting. We know gerrymandering is a problem. The next census is coming toward us. We have to get more aggressive about fixing this. So we began a coalition. We have some underlying principles and priorities. An independent redistricting commission is the top of the line. That's the thing that we want to work towards the most. We're the only major democracy that allows legislators any role at all in drawing their maps. The only major democracy that allows that. And other countries look at us and they say, that is a deep conflict of interest that undermines the integrity of your elections. There's only one other democracy in the world that allows this, and that's Malaysia. <laughs> so, I don't want to say anything about Malaysia, but that's the only other country that allows it. There are some countries that did have, have legislators drawing the maps, realized it was a problem, and then decades ago addressed that and changed it, moved to independent commissions. We're the only democracy that continues to allow it. So there's um, two bills that we support. They would put in place a constitutional amendment to create an impartial citizens redistricting commission. Um, we supported two bills in the last legislative session and those bills died when the legislative session ended. Um, last December, uh, a group met in Senator Lisa Boscola's office to look at her bill and the other bill that we had supported from Representative David Parker. He's a Republican from Monroe County. And it was really a fascinating, um, fascinating experience. There were five Fair Districts folks, well, five of part of our coalition. One was a constitutional lawyer from the Public Interest Law Center. Um, several others, Barry Kaufman from Common Cause, myself. And then legislative staffers from Senate, from House, from Rep Republicans, from Democrats, about 16 to 18, sitting in a room together, looking at redistricting reform, talking about what would make a strong constitutional amendment? How would you build a strong commission? What are the ways that someone would try to rig the system, hack the system? do it for their own good. And from that came um, Senate Bill 22, introduced by Lisa Boscola in January, and then House Bill 722, introduced by Steve Samuelson. He's a Democrat. The Republican co-sponsor, Eric Rowe, is from Chester County, uh, just over the line from Maryland. So he says, I see this play out in Maryland. <coughs> Both parties do it. We need to fix it. The House Bill, I'm just realizing I have it, it says currently 96 co-sponsors. It's really currently 98. Uh, 29 Republicans, 69 Democrats. It's only four away from a simple majority. So people say, is this doable? I say, look, we have 98 co-sponsors. And then there are people who say, some of those, they'll just put their name on there to get you to stop bothering them. And I say, well, we're going to keep bothering them. And if it comes for a vote, they're going to know they need to vote because we're going to keep bothering them. Um, but we're, we're moving in toward a majority in the House. Um, we're stuck in that both bills are in committee. And in Pennsylvania, the way bills move through committee is the committee chairs are king. And until they decide to give it a hearing, nothing happens. And right now, neither chair is, is giving it a hearing. To, um, the, the way this would work is there would be a commission that would be people from the, both major parties and then from the um, independent or third party, there'd be three pools of candidates. And then from those pools, there'd be four from the two major party pools, three from the independent third party pool and those 11 would draw the maps. The maps would have to be approved by at least seven with one from each of those pools. They wouldn't be allowed to use any kind of data about how you vote, how you're registered. None of that information would be available. The whole process would be transparent. All the information would be on a website. Anybody could look at the data. Anybody could look at the, the computer programming that they were used. There would be complete disclosure. I can answer more questions about that and go into great more detail about that, but I know our time is short. To do this, it's a constitutional amendment, which means it has to go through the legislature, both houses, twice. That's a heavy lift, and it has to be done in time for a public referendum in 2020. The next census starts in April of 2020, the next reapportionment, January 2021, and then redistricting comes in 2021. So this is a lot to get done in that time. Now people say, 
lawsuits. When lawsuits solve the problem? There's a lawsuit that's been heard by the Supreme Court, Guild versus Whitford. It's from Wisconsin. It's based on something called the efficiency gap. And the efficiency gap measures wasted votes. And I'm not going to go into the math of it. If you want, I could talk to you later. But um, it measures wasted votes. And the people who did this study, Stephanopoulos and McGee, their idea was, so people are litigating this, and some states should litigate it, and some states, it's not really a big deal. And we've got to find a way to measure it. And the only way this is going to get any traction in the Supreme Court is to be able to offer a judiciable standard. Um, because the last time this was brought to the Supreme Court here in Pennsylvania, V versus Jubilierer back in 2004, uh, the Supreme Court decided that although gerrymandering might be a problem, there was no judiciable standard that they could that they could use, and so they would not address it. So people have been working on coming up with a standard that will hold up in the Supreme Court, and this efficiency gap is one standard that they came up with. According to the standard, you can see Wisconsin down there. You can see Pennsylvania. According to the standard, we're the worst. So um, when we saw that that the Wisconsin case had actually won in court in Wisconsin, people in Pennsylvania started saying, hey, <laughs> we need to think about this. And so the League of Women Voters um, had was part of a case that was introduced back in the summer with um, the Public Interest Law Center and a pro bono. I've, forget the name of the law firm. Um, and it's a really interesting approach. It's based on the Pennsylvania Constitution, because their, their uh, argument is the Pennsylvania Constitution actually offers more protection to voters than the, the federal Constitution. And if it's appealed to the state Constitution, it will be heard here in Pennsylvania. It doesn't go to the Supreme Court. And the state the, the current um, configuration of the Pennsylvania court leans very heavily democratic. Um, so there's a number of really interesting pieces at play in this. And some of you just think, well, the courts should not lean in any direction. The courts should just be fair. But the reality is what it is. Um, so this case was introduced in the summer. Um, we were told that it was probably never going to, you know, it wouldn't be heard, certainly not be heard in time for the next, um, the, the primary for the next uh, congressional races. And the, um, the leadership in Harrisburg has pretty much said, we're not giving you hearings on your bill while these, these ca this case is in play, because anything that happens might impact the case, which is legal nonsense, um, and we know. But it's all been kind of, it, it, you know, you watch the time frame and you think, how is this going to play out? Well, just recently, the, uh, there was an appeal to the, Supre the su state Supreme Court for extraordinary jurisdiction, which means it would get speeded up. And they, they won that appeal. So the, the Supreme Court said, this case has to be resolved by the end of December. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing to watch. Yesterday, there were seven motions filed on this case in which our legislative leadership was trying to move it from state court, state Supreme Court to federal court. And then some of those in that said, well, we didn't agree to that. And it, if you follow it, it kind of feels like a ping pong ball. But it's staying, it's staying right now, it's staying where it is in state court. There's another case, Agger versus Wolf, um, which is being appealed in district court. And um, that's a very unique approach, basically saying we don't need a standard. Um, we have protections that our elections are supposed to be completely neutral. And if there's any indication at all that the lines were drawn in a way that was not neutral, then those lines are invalid. Will they win? I don't know. It's a fascinating <laughs> argument. We'll see. Um, and that one also will be heard, I believe, on December 5th. So that one has to be decided in December as well. And this week is a big deal because last week our um, legislative leaders appealed. They said they had legislative privilege, which meant that none of the information about how the lines were drawn needed to be revealed. Oh, wow. And that they did not need to disclose any of their email, any of their correspondence, any of their conversations. If they had legislative privilege, and none of that needed to be revealed. So last Friday, district court said, you do not have legislative privilege. And they, they said, legislative privilege can be pierced, is what they said. And any conversation with anybody outside of the legislature is automatically not covered by legislative privilege. And you have a week 
to disclose all of this. So today is the end of that week. We're waiting with great eagerness to see the disclosures that will be coming. Um, and if you read the cases, the recent cases in Wisconsin, there's a case going on in North Carolina. If you read those cases, uh, it's very embarrassing, let's just put it that way, to the leadership when those conversations become public knowledge. You begin to see who they work for and who do they, they do not work for. They do not work for us. You can't take politics out of the process. People, I, I spoke to a representative this week who said, you know, how do you know that your idea is, 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 is the right one? I said, it's, it's certainly not going to be perfect. There is no perfect solution. There's no solution that's going to remove politics completely. But I promise you, taking it out of the hands of the people who benefit the most and putting it into something that is more transparent and has more safeguards will be light years better than what we currently have. It will not be perfect. We will never have maps that everybody says, this is the best map in the history of the world. That's not going to happen. But we can get a long way towards something better and more fair. You, can't remove, you can remove the personal motivation, and you can put safeguards on the whole process. And just to say again, every other major democracy uses an independent citizens commission. Or actually, some use just a simple administrator. You know, they just give the information to somebody in an office somewhere, and it's done in that way. But no one, no one else, except for Malaysia, allows legislators any role. So how can you help? Well, since January, we have been starting county-based groups. We have 30, we might have 30, we're somewhere around 35 county-based groups across the state. Um, and those groups are all working hard to do public information events like this, to talk to their legislators. Um, we have seven, I think we're up to eight groups in Philly. We have six in Pittsburgh. We've held well over 300 public meetings since January, reaching over 16,000 people since January. Sometimes I look at the list because every day we have meetings. At first I was having anxiety attacks because people would say, oh, I hear you're speaking. And they would say places, I think, I don't know who's doing that, but I know it's not me. Um, and now I sometimes look at our spreadsheet where we record them and I think, we have 20 meetings since the last time I looked. Um, and they're just kind of adding up very quickly. We also are passing resolutions um, in counties and municipalities. And, and this, is, this is a, we don't count this on our, in our number of informational meetings, but these are citizens going to their local officials, those local meetings, and doing short presentations to say, we are harmed by this, and explaining how we're harmed. And so we've had 12 counties pass resolutions over 130 municipalities. We just learned uh, the past week or so, Clinton County is our first county to reach 100% coverage. Every municipality in Clinton County and the county itself all passed resolutions. The reason this is fascinating is it's in Speaker Pro Tem Joe Scarnati's district. <laughs> so we're planning a press conference to deliver all of those resolutions to, to the speaker um, and to say your constituents, your local officials, uh, believe that this is an issue that deserves your attention. Here in Delaware County, you have um, four townships that or, or boroughs that have passed resolutions, Radnor, Haverford, Lansdowne, and Swarthmore. And how can you get involved? You can join us. I meant to bring a paper petition, and I didn't, but there's a piece of paper here. Some of you, I know, already get our newsletters. That, that paper right there. Uh, right there, yeah, it's just a piece of paper. If you do not already get our newsletters, we would love you just to put your name and email address on this piece of paper, in which case we will send you an email saying, you know, here's a link to our petition if you would like to sign it. And then you would also just get on our email list so you get our newsletters and find out more about what's happening. Um, as I said, we've got local groups. Hugh Roberts, our local group um, coordinator, is here and he'd love to talk to any of you after. He's going to say a few words after I take questions. Um, we invite you to volunteer, donate. Most of our donations are online donations. The average is $35. We're always happy to have people contribute. But also, here's the thing. All of us have influence that we don't really know about. We, we need to think about. So, you know, if you're a lawyer, are you part of a bar association? Are you a business owner? You know, do you know other business owners? You know, what's the association that you're in or were in? You know, what, are the, what is the group that you're part of that might be interested in getting more involved? And part of what we're asking people to do is think about what is, what is the issue you really care about? How does it connect with this one? And how do you get the people who care about that to care about this? Because it's going to take 
all of us working together to make this change. As I was told when we started, reform is not possible in Pennsylvania. I was amazed how many people told me that. I would talk to people around the country about what's, you know, what would be the best way to address this? And, and we'd have these conversations. They say, yeah, independent commission, that's really a, a really, really um, impactful change, a really significant change. It would really alter the face of democracy in your state. And then there'd, there'd be this, but you're in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I would, I would listen for the next, and, and I'd say yes. And they'd say, reform is not possible in Pennsylvania. And I'd say, and why is that? And they would say, well, you don't have initiative and referendum, and your leadership will never give up power, and your citizens are not paying attention. So we're in a place where citizens are paying attention. More and many citizens, so we've had this huge groundswell since January of people saying, something's broken and we don't know what, but what you're suggesting <coughs> sounds important. How can we help? Um, so what we're trying to say is yes, things are broken, and we can. There are ways to fix them, but we need to work together to to pry those leaders' hands open, to remind them that power belongs to the people. Our state constitution says power should belong to the people, and that the people have the right to reform, alter, or abolish the constitution as they see fit. We need to exercise that right. We need to remind our leaders that that is our right to reform and alter. Our, our government and we need to do that together as creatively as we can. So thank you so much for being a great audience. Carol's uh, an inspiration, she's phenomenal um, and she's taken this organization from 150 people in November of last year to 16,000 that have attended these uh, sessions in one way or another and it's <laughs> I retired in uh, March yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, just happened to be invited to a meeting where Carol, well actually no, I was invited to a meeting where they were organizing the Delaware County version of Fair Districts. Laura was there and uh, she uh, explained what was going on and I was fascinated and I decided after never having been involved in any local politics, I didn't even know who my congressman or senator or any of this stuff. I've now become the Delaware County Chairman. So I've been heavily engaged in this for the last six months uh, and uh, very passionate about it because um, I really believe this is about saving democracy. This is the way through these maps by which democracy is literally expressed. This is how your vote is expressed in the state legislature and in, in the U.S. Congress. and. Um, it needs to be taught in civics class. These kids need to be drawing their maps so they understand how democracy works because most people don't realize any of this stuff. Anyway, um, so Delaware County has 48 townships. We're trying to get resolutions passed in all of those. We passed about six. Uh, we could do a lot more. We don't have one passed in media yet. We don't want have one passed in Nether Providence. Uh, those could be easy, probably. Um, we just need some folks to take ownership of those and get uh, help us. And I've got all the material. I've got the, the methodology by which you do it. So that's an area we need some help. Um, we have 11 House representatives covering Delaware County. Uh, six of them have co-sponsored. Five have not. Of those five. Four are Republicans. One Republican has co-sponsored the bill. Um, you probably know the ones that haven't. Barrar, Quinn, and a few others. I don't have them off the top of my head. The Senators, we have two co-sponsors, uh, and they're both Democrats, and then we have two that have not co-sponsored. That's McGarrigal and Senator Killian, Tom Killian. Uh, Tom Killian has expressed support um, for the bill. He's got some issues at the moment, though he won't speak to constituents, as will any of the Republicans, uh, generally, uh, citing the lawsuit. So we're waiting for that to change. Um, in any event, uh, I think Senator Killian is somebody that could be influenced um, and is a moderate Republican. So 
He's also the minority chair of the Senate state government. That's another great point. The committee which is looking at this is the state government committee, and that's because it's a constitutional amendment. <coughs> Tom Killian is the assistant uh, or the uh, vice chair of that committee, so it's important for us to get to Tom Killian. Um, so what can we do? Um, and what can you do? First of all, fill out that email or sign up on the site. The easiest way to do it is just to go onto the site. Um, you can sign up as a subscriber, which doesn't mean you're committed to anything. It means you get a newsletter. But you also get an email which invites you to do more. And if you want to do more, then you just complete that. And that finds its way back to me. Uh, and then uh, we are in the very process <coughs> of relaunching, if you will, Delaware County because we're a little behind our neighboring counties and they're frankly kicking our ass and we need to do something about it. Um, so I'm really looking for help. Uh, we need people who will take ownership of certain types of things. It's not a big commitment, but it amounts to driving a resolution in your township, getting some neighbors together, organizing, getting in front of the commission. Uh, another thing is tabling events. We found these to be very effective. Um, basically, there's organizations having meetings and fairs and stuff all over the county all the time. We just want to have fair districts there. We've gathered a lot of uh, volunteers and donors at those uh, things. Polling. Um, at the polls recently, uh, fantastic story. We started the project probably three weeks before the polls. We had over 400 volunteers attend the polls in various targeted counties where we were literally looking to influence a particular um, legislator. They got over 1,250. I mean, 12,500. 12,500 signatures. signatures. In one day. There's great appetite for this. So, honestly, I just lucked into this volunteer thing because this is one that's really working. And um, I, you know, I think it's a lot harder in a lot of cases, but this one really resonates with a lot of people. Uh, <clears throat> so, legislative contacts is calling your legislator, visiting your legislator. Uh, we can help with that. We have all kinds of material. The, the communications team that puts some of this stuff together, and you'll see some of the brochures and stuff that's been done uh, amazingly well over a short period of time, and there's tons of that material. Um, and then, of course, donors, contacts. And we're trying to move up from just a pure grassroots activist uh, constituent sort of a world to some of the influence, <coughs> business contacts, seniors, executives, and so forth. We're trying to reach that level. We need to bring a little bit more of the power factor into the discussion. So um, anybody that has any of that, I'm actually leading the business outreach effort for the, for the state, um, along with another a group of other folks. and. Uh, we are trying to get to chambers of commerce, uh, associations, trade organizations, etc., to get their endorsement. We want to put on our page all those organizations who are endorsing this effort. Get their logos up there. Um, that's it. Long-winded pitch, but uh, really hope you'll uh, join. Thank you.